today is Danny Mendez. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. Hey. Thank you for joining us today. Danny, you are a financial strategist. And just so our listeners know what the heck that is, can you just tell us about what you do and what your credentials are? Absolutely. Um, basically, a financial planner. I've been doing this close to 20 years. And what that means is putting portfolios together, making sure that people's financial goals are being met and that they can navigate through these markets. Because right now, everyone's pretty nervous. They don't know what's going on. So it's my job to help them navigate these waters. Yeah. So we always try to emphasize the importance of paying attention to your finances. It's not waiting until you're close to retirement, which is what a lot of us do, <laughs> right? But paying attention to that, even as you go, there's sort of a misconception that you don't have to worry about it so much until you're close to retirement. But we're not even talking just about retirement today. We want to help people figure out what they should or should not be doing right now in this current climate. So we're, we've are we asked you to come up with your top 10 things to do or not do. So let's okay. get right to it. What's number right, one? Perfect. So, well, the good news is about what's going on. It is making people look at their finances because they do not know exactly what the future holds. A lot of people are actually staying home, especially if you're a business owner, or you own a restaurant, or you own any sort of brick and mortar store, especially here in New York, like they're making you shut down. So what's happening is people are actually focusing on that, saying, okay, what do I need to figure out for the next month if my business is closed for another two months? What's gonna have to happen? So it is making people focus on how their financial cash flow works, and how their finances are actually situated. Because a lot of people don't, don't think about it. As long as a check comes in, they're happy. They're like, hey, my check's gonna come in even if I spend all of it and I got $1 left and it's Thursday and I get paid on Friday, they know a check is coming in on Friday. But once that check is, you know, may not come in, now they're like, oh, maybe I should actually start planning. What happens if this check doesn't come in? What, how am I gonna feed my family? How am I gonna basically run my household? And that's what's making, this is making people actually start looking at their finances. So one so of the is very advice, first things that you should be doing, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so um, I, I would suspect that people looking at their finances more is uh, creating a little bit of panic with a lot of people because they're seeing their 401ks go down and they're not seeing paychecks coming in. So I mean, do you have some advice just to you know how they how you should manage your emotions when you're starting to look at those finances a little bit more like you were just talking about absolutely so one of the things people really freak out in is when they look at their 401k or retirement plans or even their investment accounts they see a drop of 30 35 percent and they're like man my hundred thousand went down to sixty five thousand. maybe i should put out the market and that's the last thing you should do so especially when it comes to retirement plans, if you're in your 30s, 40s, even early 50s, your retirement is still many, many years away. So the last thing you should do is do any sort of panic selling. And that happens a lot during these times. What I would be more focused on is say, hey, how much of our emergency savings do we actually have liquidity do we have just in case a check doesn't come in for the next three months? I would say that should be the bigger focus and not so much the 401k right now. Because listen, market cycles come and go. 2008, we had a, from the peak to the bottom in 2008, it was a almost an over 50% drop, which means if you had 100,000, you were below 50,000 at one point. And that can freak a lot of people out. But listen, mm -hmm. by the end of 2009, 2010, we came back. So it's not so much about the retirement plan, it's so much about the cash flow for the next couple of months. That should be focus number one. So tip number one is don't panic. But Definitely I think part panic. of that, like you just said, is resist the urge to start open up, opening up your portfolio, right? It's just gonna stress you out if you see your 401k dropping. Absolutely, a lot of people get freaked out and they are checking their 401ks. Listen, no matter how much I tell people not to check, their accounts are still checking it because and they, especially when the news is nonstop talking about the Dow drop in 2000 points, which is insane. And, you know, biggest one point drops in history, people get nervous. And don't get me wrong, the media is really pushing that, hey, the Dow has had the biggest drop ever. You should, you know, freak out about what's going on. 
Um, but yesterday, the market was up 11% in one day, which these swings are unprecedented. I mean, to go up 11% in a day is insane. People go up 11% a year, and it's happening in a day. So it's just massive swings taking place. So if you look at your portfolio every day, you're going to go crazy. Yeah. So, and again, you know, it's more urgent right now that people are looking at their cash flow, like you said, it, unless you're retiring tomorrow, it's less relevant what right. is actually in your 401k because you're not using your 401k to pay your bills and, you know, pay, put food on the table right now. Correct. Um, but That's correct. I'm looking at your top 10 list and you had for number two, you had selling stocks and investments during negative mar markets. So what's your tip there? Right. So it, again, it comes down to the emotional trading. So what happens is when people panic, they want to preserve everything they have. So if you have a portfolio and you look one day and it's 80,000, the next day is 70 and the next day is 60, the very first urge you have is like, oh, I want to stop this bleeding. Let me just sell everything and go into cash. Because everyone thinks if they see it going down, it's going to go down to zero. Very, very unlikely for your portfolio, depending on how you're invested, of course. It's very unlikely for your portfolio to go down to zero if you're in a 401k, no matter how aggressive you're invested. So, but what people do is they're like, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell. Same thing happened in 2008 when their portfolio went down 50%. They're like, all right, I'm going to go down to zero. I'm just going to sell everything. The moment you sell, you take in that loss and there's nothing you can do about it. Now you're just sitting in cash and you basically mm -hmm. took a loss. So that's why I tell people don't sell when you are emotional. Well, I think that is the urge, especially, and correct me if I'm wrong, but especially for people that are really risk averse because they see that stock price going down yes. and they're, you know, like a free fall and their reaction is to sort of put their hand out and stop it, stop the bleeding. But it right. sounds like from what you're saying, what they're really doing is just, they're really absorbing that loss because they're not even giving it an opportunity to come back in the future. Yep. No, Danny, I wanted to ask you something before we moved on to number three, um, cause you've given me this advice in the past. I think this is an example of why you cannot put all your savings in the stock market anyway, because you know, what you and Christina were just talking about, if you needed access to cash, you would have to sell right now to get access to your money. If you know, Absolutely. other things dried up, it's a, it, it's all the more important to have a diversification to have money just in this in the savings account and other places you can get at it. I just think that this sort of environment crystallizes how we all need to think about diversifying everything that we have in terms of our savings. Absolutely. So I'm getting calls right now from clients and they want to, they remember 2008. So they were like, Hey, I know that the market came back. So what can I do with this money that I have in savings? I should invest it because I know the market is coming back. That's their thought process. But the very first question I ask him is like, all right, let's see how your cash flows and let's see how your emergency savings is. And if they don't have much in emergency savings, or if that is their emergency savings, I'll tell them, Yes, you may be right, and yes, the market may come back, but I would rather you keep that money in cash just in case. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Just in case yeah. your cash flow stops, I want you to have cash available. If you invest it and the market takes a downturn and you need the cash, now you're in a bad position. So, so what this is where the planning comes in. You have to create a plan. Sorry, there's a little bit of a Go delay, ahead, I'm so I'm sorry interrupting each other <laughs> what would you tell people though that uh, once they go through their cash what would be the next thing that you would tell them to tap into to pay expenses should they incur debt or sh should they liquidate something and if so what would that be so it all depends so it all depends on how your portfolio is situated um and it all depends on their li their lifestyle so the very first thing we got to do is kind of look at their budget and see exactly where their cash is going or where their expenses are going. You know, they may have gym memberships that they're paying for right now where they can't even go into, or they may have some credit card debt that they need to get out of this credit card debt, especially if they're high interest bearing. This is unprecedented times. Like even in 2008, financial markets were crashing, but this is different. This is a virus going through the country and the government is telling you, you have to shut down your business. You cannot go outside. 
So it's a very, very different scenario. But the good news is that a lot of these credit card companies or anything that you owe money to, they're actually becoming quite flexible. So if you have, like, say, credit card debt, just to use this as an example, and a lot of your cash is going towards this credit card debt, you can actually call them up and say, hey, because of what's going on, I cannot pay this. Maybe you can stop the interest for the next 60 days. And they're doing that. Even car insurance companies, you call Geico and they're like, OK, we're going to you don't have to pay us for the next 60 days and we're not going to cancel your insurance. So there's a lot of companies coming very flexible and that people's cash flow is really ending. So the first thing we have to do is see exactly how your lifestyle is going and where we can kind of slow down those costs where maybe you don't heard that or maybe you don't have to liquidate in a down market. So that's, we got to do that like from the beginning, if that makes sense. So I know that there are some people who might be saying, well, I don't want, I want to not pay credit cards because that will affect my credit score. Do you happen to know if there are credit card companies that are not reporting to the credit bureaus if you do forego payments for that, a few months? That actually has been the conversation right now because they don't want credit card companies to affect people's credit score based on what's going on now. Because let's take an example, you're a retail store and the retail store is doing absolutely amazing and then one day the government tells you to shut down. If you have to shut down and your cash flow ends, the government the government is basically telling these credit card companies like, listen, it's not their fault that there's no money. It's this this is a virus that's going around. So maybe it's a good idea if you guys do not report to the credit is and let them know that these guys are not paying their paying their bills on time because they're basically giving you a furlough of maybe two months. So you can get your stuff situated and to see what happens because we don't know what's going to happen in two months. You know, the government came out saying that they want everybody to go back to work during, you know, by Easter. But all the health professionals are saying that it seems impossible. So we don't know what's going to happen in a month. So to answer your question, credit card companies will most likely not report to the credit agencies. Again, it all depends on every credit card company is different, but I think the big ones are not going to do it. So probably the good advice would be to check with the credit card company. For sure. Absolutely. Everyone is different and it doesn't hurt to have a conversation with them and let them know what's going on. And they might say, okay, we're going to freeze the account for two months. You may not be able to use it, but at least you won't have to make that payment. Okay. Well, that's good advice because I know people are probably concerned about that. Your number four is emotional trading. And I think you did just touch on that a little bit earlier. Yes. And it goes on both ways. It's on the selling part. It's also on the buying. People get emotional. They see the market down 2,000 points. They're like, oh, now is the time to jump in. But again, it's emotional trading. So you have to just have a plan and stick to it. But you did recommend earlier, maybe for the people that aren't having cash flow problems and are less risk averse, would do you recommend that they buy? Well, I would say this. Um, if you look at history, the typical downturns when it comes to the market is around 30 to 35 percent. And we're in that range right now. Um, not to say we cannot go any lower, but to go from the market highs to the current lows at about 30 percent, it's not a bad time to jump in. Or you can dip your toe in slowly. I wouldn't say, hey, put all your chips on the table. Maybe what you do is put in 20 percent and then you can jump in little by little. Because typically the market lows will be tested again. Hopefully I'm wrong and we just have upturns from here on going forward. But if it does get tested again, you all your chips in the market. Well, I know I'm going off the script a little bit, Denny, but what are you doing? Okay. <laughs> Tell us what you're doing. Are you buying? So I am dipping in slowly little by little. There's some markets that are really beaten up, like the airline industry, the cruise industries. I mean, these are markets that are down, were down 60%. And this true trillion dollar stimulus package is aimed towards those industries. Because listen, they don't want the airlines to go bankrupt. They don't want these cruise lines to go bankrupt. They don't want people to go bankrupt. So I do think some of these companies will be coming back. So those are industries that I'm looking at, especially the airlines. I mean, to go down 60%, what are the chances that some of these airlines are going to go bankrupt? Outside of going bankrupt, there will most likely be a merger before anything goes bankrupt. So you know, just tipping, going slowly. That's all I will say. There's not that many airlines left. They're going to merge and there's only going to be like two or three left. 
<laughs> there you go. Well, you know, if you, if you remember, go ahead, Christina. Well, listen, that's great advice. Thank you for giving us that little tip. And if people want to know more, they'll just have to call you, right? No, that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so number, number five on our list is how COVID-19 has affected financial markets. And I know that you have been talking about that a little bit already. Absolutely. So the virus obviously has completely changed how we even work. So how many people do you know are working from home right now? So it's practically everybody, especially yeah, in the Northeast, forget about it. It's everyone. So I do think after all of this is over, again, this is just my opinion. After all of this is over, I think a lot of businesses, especially industries, are going to start basically taking a step back and saying, okay, we've spent X dollar amount in you know, having these buildings over in Manhattan, you know, to have run in Manhattan is exorbitant. So some of them might say, you know what, we've been doing okay for the last month with people working from home. Maybe we can test these waters and say, okay, maybe we'll keep 10% of the workforce at home and keep the other 90% in the office. And that way it will lower their cost as long as their business continues operating. And I think a lot of retailers are also going to go that same route. I think they're going to do a bigger focus on an online presence versus a retail presence because if anything like this ever happens again and they somebody comes in and says hey you have to close down your retail stores a business does not want they want their cash flow to end so they're like hey i want to figure out a way that i can continue generating business even if my people have to be home or even if my retail closes down so i do think the industry is going to change as far as more people working from home versus being in an office. And that's a big yeah, thing. I mean, that's a change. That's yeah, like, it really is. I mean, I, it has forced us, even as a, a small business ourselves, it's forced us to change our work habits and to learn how to be more productive at home. But you know what? It's working. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at the beginning is an adjustment, but then after a while, you're like, okay, maybe working in my pajamas and so as long as the business gets done, if you're more on the, you know, the operator side. It'll be interesting to see how this changes business after this. I, I think you're right. I think a lot of businesses are going to be sticking with this to some degree when they see that they can actually yeah. be productive and you know, probably cut costs too. Oh yeah. Exactly. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at, they're looking at cutting costs. We're still increasing the bottom line. I think this is, as big a change as when email was introduced. When email was introduced, the inter-office envelope was basically disappeared. And I think this is as big of a change. Oh God, I remember. Well, what's interesting about this right now too, is that there are still so many people that are resistant to the technology because if mm -hmm. they haven't done it before, if they're not very comfortable with it, they just resist that. So they kind of, you know, like what you said with email, you know, there, there were and are still so many people. Um, we'll, I like to refer to them as seasoned professionals who are resistant to that because they didn't, you know, come of age during the age of technology and they're just afraid of it. They'd rather pop something in the mail or even pick up the phone and call someone rather than have to use email or other technology. So I think in some strange way that this is a blessing. Yeah, so you, you also reference cash flow and debt awareness on your top 10 list. And, and we did talk about that a little bit, but what did you want to emphasize there? So for, for people that want to jump into the market, because right now, like I was saying before, some people do want to jump into the market, but I would be more focused on what kind of debt are you carrying? Do you have any credit cards that are paying that you're paying over 20% in interest? If you, you do have debt, I would be more focused on paying down that debt because we don't know how long this is going to last. We're hoping it lasts another two to four weeks, but it might last another two to four months. And if that does take place, we want to make sure that your debt isn't pulling you down. So I would be more focused on instead of seeing what opportunities are in the market and paying down your debt. Because again, this is forcing people to stay home. And when they stay home, they start focusing on their lives. My kitchen's a mess. My bedroom's a mess. My financials are a mess. So now what they're doing, now you can actually focus on, okay, where can you make some improvements and let's sit down and figure out a plan to, you know, improve 
those things that you can improve. And that is one of them. Anything that you have with high interest, like you're losing money. What's that, John? <laughs> oh, I said, I feel like Denny's been in my <laughs> messy everything. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, Danny, when it when it comes when it comes to um, when it comes to this, what can people actually do with their finances without actually speaking to a professional? Obviously, uh, we encourage people to reach out to um, professionals such as yourself. But when you sit down, I mean, what can someone who's a, a complete disaster area when it comes to their finances? What is it that they can do? What's the first step they can do to try to get things under control? Very first thing I tell everyone is take a basically take a natural picture of where you currently stand. What that means is like, okay, if you have 10 credit cards and whatever your bills are, listen, put them all on the table. Let's take out all your statements or go online and pull up all the information and maybe either write it down or put it on a spreadsheet. Listen, if you're computer illiterate and you don't know how to use Excel, just Take a piece of paper and write it down. Okay, this is how much I owe Amex, this is how much I owe Visa, whatever it is. And then start writing down exactly how your financial picture looks like. You can see how much you have in your retirement plans, how much you have in savings, how much income is coming in, how much debt you're carrying, just to kind of write it down. Even if it doesn't make sense in the beginning, at least get it on a piece of paper. After it's on a paper, now we can begin organizing it. You can say, okay, this is where my cash flow is going, to my investment accounts, this is my debt. And then little by little, we kind of start organizing that picture. Once we have everything on kind of one page, if you will, then we can begin attacking certain areas. We can say, okay, maybe I'm carrying too much debt and this is what I should do for the debt. Oh, maybe I have, you know, too much cash. This is what I should do with the cash. Oh, I don't have enough cash. Maybe I have to increase my cash. So that way we can begin attacking certain areas. But the very first thing is you have to see where you land. Yeah, and if you, there, it's never too late to do Does that. that right? Yep. So if you haven't done it. Oh, never. Hopefully never, you have plenty of time right now, right? <laughs> okay, so we know Exactly right. Time. Yes, sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. I don't mean to interrupt you. So the tax totally. filing deadline has been pushed to July 15th. That's confirmed, right? That is confirmed, yes. So right now you do not have the April 15th deadline because, again, a lot of businesses are forced to close. So they pushed it to July 15th for now. And the good news for that is that anyone that has to pay taxes, they are they don't have to pay those taxes until later and they don't have to they're not going to incur any penalties they're not going to incur any interest which is always a nice thing i'm not saying you should sit on your butt and not file your taxes if you can i'm just saying that you do have some time to do it and you can if you want to you can do it earlier you can you absolutely can there might be people who are expect a refund and would like their refund what about the um you're in new york we're in new uh, jersey yeah. Are, are the filing deadlines also okay. pushed back for New York and New Jersey, to your knowledge? Well, it's for the federal. So it's for the federal, so it's for everyone. As far as the state is concerned, they're following the federal. Okay, good to know. So um, you have a number eight on your list is potential cash access from insurance policies. What did you want to share about that? Correct. So some a lot of people have insurance policies with cash value in them. So this is great for people that, especially right now, if they're running into a bit of a cash crunch, maybe they could look at their insurance policies and they could be able to borrow money out of their insurance policies to help with that cash flow. So a lot of people don't realize, but actually Walt Disney had a pretty decent insurance policy back in the day. And when he was getting Disney World off the ground, he actually needed to access cash because he didn't have any. And luckily he has some cash and insurance policies and he borrowed some money to get Disney World up and running. So a lot of times people get gifted insurance policies from their parents. It could be, you know, small policies, that doesn't matter. But the fact that you have access to cash versus selling stocks or selling investments that might be down where you're taking losses, just borrow your own money. So that's one thing that people can look at. Would that be preferable to borrowing against a retirement asset, like a 401k? Yes, I would prefer to take money out of an insurance policy as a 401k because right now most 401ks are down. So you will be able to borrow less from a 401k. And not only that, if you take 
take the money out of the 401k, guess what? That's money that you're taking now and you don't have invested in the market. I'd rather you just keep it in there and ride the wave versus an insurance policy where depending on what kind of policy you have, you can be able to take that out and just pay a small, a small rate on it. And the rates are so low at this point that it should be negligible. Well, that's excellent information. Yeah. You also have number nine is 401k rebalancing. What is, what are you referring to yes. there? So everyone has 401ks. Well, let's say most working people have a 401k. So depending on how your 401k is allocated right now, if you're a young person, if you have two million in a conservative bucket, you may want to rebalance it and make it a little bit more aggressive. Or most people, depending on how their 401ks are allocated, keep in mind, if you're still working, money's still coming out of your checks and you're still investing in your 401k. So the good news is right now, though the market is down, all that money that's going into your 401k, you're actually buying shares at a cheaper price, theoretically. So depending on how your 401k is invested, you may want to see maybe shift a little bit more to the aggressive side and buy things since the aggressive end is a lot cheaper because that's taking the bigger hit. You may want to buy some shares now because it's a little cheaper. Um, and of course, it all depends on where you are in your retirement, if you're 10 years away versus 20 years away. But you may want to start rebalancing your 401ks. And another thing, say you are you know, in risk of losing your job, may need to tap into your 401k just in case something happens. You may want to rebalance it more towards the conservative end because, hey, this might be money that you're going to utilize any you know, sometime soon if worse, you know, push comes to shove. So you always want to look at everything. And number 10, last but not least, you have opportunities. What would you have invested in during 2008? So what did you mean by that? So, well, think about it. Most of us, you know, remember 2008. So what would, you, if you had a thousand bucks, where would you have invested it in 2008? So I like to use Citigroup as a good example. So, you know, Citibank is obviously still around. Um, but at one time in 2008, I remember Citigroup was around $2 a share. Imagine getting into Citigroup at two bucks a share. So this is for the people that already have, they already know what's going on with the 401k. They have their emergency stash. They already have their cash flow pretty much under control. No real debt. And they're like, I still got an extra couple of bucks and I know I want to jump into the market. So at this point now, you can start looking at the industries that have gotten pretty beat up, like we spoke about a little while ago. And then you can tip in your toe very slowly into the market. And think about just 2008, even though 2008 was a really, really tough year, there were some people that their businesses were still running, had cash flow, and they were doing okay. What would they have invested in? So think of this just like 2008. This is just a little different. And retailers, retailers have gotten pretty beat up pretty bad. Um, but think about Amazon. Amazon just hired 100,000 people because they can't keep up with the demand. So there are some industries and there are some opportunities out there. Yeah, it is interesting to see how things are evolving now in the market. Yeah, Denny, I noticed that um, there's nobody on the floor of the stock exchange. How is that? How, do, how does that impact the market? I'm just <laughs> curious myself. It really doesn't. You don't really need anyone on the you know on the stock exchange. That's really more for show. Um, I actually <laughs> remember going into the stock exchange in the late '90s, early 2000s, and I mean the floor was still pretty packed. And this is when computers were really starting to take over. There's still 100 people on the floor. Now it's very few people on the floor. It's a lot of it is for show because someone has to maintain those computers, um, but people could do most of it from home. It's it is pretty jarring to see not in a bad way it's just it goes to show how the industry has changed when before it was so much paper and pen yelling and screaming now computers are doing the bulk of the work well now the new york stock exchange is going to look so, more like the that. market if that's your question people are still buying people are still selling. <laughs> well i can't wait to see <laughs> listen what when comes this is over the there's still going to be on the stock exchange that's never going to work yeah. Well, maybe maybe after all this, they just won't return. It is going to be interesting to see it in like five years. Yeah, it will be. So it sounds maybe, like maybe, in I don't some, know. in I like some, people on the side it's, for it. uh, these are some really great tips. I learned a lot just from this list. But if people want individual advice, you gave a typical lawyer answer. It depends. And 
I can see how that's true. It does depend on your particular financial circumstances. So if anybody wants specific advice to their circumstances as to how they should handle their cash flow right now, or if they're having a cash flow problem, what they should potentially liquidate or borrow against, um, you're available to help them with that. So how could they reach you, Absolutely. Denny? I'll give you my office line. It's 212-408-9585. Again, 212-408-9585. It's probably the best way to reach me right now. Excellent. Thank you, Denny. I hope that our viewers got something out of this and we'd love to have you on again, maybe in a week or so and kind of see, see what's been happening in the world. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime you guys need me, I'm always a phone call away. Thank you. Thank you. You are very, very welcome.